sir. Episode one of the Warrior's Voice. What do you think? It, um, it, it's hard to imagine going from, hey, are you a Marine on a sweatshirt at a Cars and Coffee here in South Carolina to, to here? Um, wow. Yeah, it's, it's pretty pretty exciting. This is, you know, all great journeys start with that first step. And today, here we are, that first step. So let, let's talk a little bit about Warrior's Voice and what we want to accomplish with this uh, uh, mission as we move forward here. Well, Zach, I think that uh, what, what the Warrior's Voice uh, identifies is that all of us have that, that voice inside of us telling, go left, go right, go center, and why. And whether it's uh, the, the struggling mom uh, is working two jobs to keep food on the table, whether it's an entrepreneur, whether it's an active duty service member, reserve or retired, we, we all have those challenges, those crucibles, which is a test, an extreme test, where we go in one side one way and come out the other end completely transformed. I agree, and I think that's the exciting thing that we're gonna be able to unpack over the next several episodes here, is look at what makes a warrior a warrior. What is the voice that they have all inside of each other? And it's interesting because when we think of a warrior, we think of the knight in shining armor, the Spartan, or the Marine, or the SEAL. But it's what you just talked about. The warrior is, is that person that has adversity, and they use adversity to shape their character, to get that grit, and to really practice and prepare them for what you mentioned, which the crucible. I always go back to thinking about iron sharpens iron. Because when we get into that crucible, that's that crisis in our life where Usually you, you can't make it through that unless you have a lot of resistance. And um, the way we met each other is being, being fellow Marines, you know, Colonel, why don't you tell us a little bit about how we met each other? Well, and where uh, we're located. Yes. So how did we meet? Um, it was by happenstance, perhaps. Uh, it was Cars and Coffee here in, uh, in Bluffton, South Carolina. And I was with a, a fellow Marine, a Sergeant Major, uh, who's now retired. Um, Depot Sergeant Major. The Depot Sergeant Major at uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island. And uh, we had our children. We were walking around looking at the vehicles, and, and we noticed, I think you had a Marine Corps frame on, the, on your vehicle. That's great. I said, oh, okay. And we kept walking around, and then uh, the Sergeant Major's son was running around. He had the USMC sweatshirt on. And you said, well, who's the jarhead or who's the leatherneck or something to that effect? And uh, Sergeant Major and I kind of looked at each other like, why? I got, I got the stink <laughs> eye from these two big jar heads, and I was like, oh, shit, this is going to go one of two ways. Either they're about ready to throw it out, or they're going to... But I could tell I didn't... didn't. I kind of offended them a little bit when I called them jar heads, but, you know, hey, uh, it's, a, it's a term of endearment, but when you're talking to an active duty colonel and a depot sergeant major, they're not quite used to the collo colloquialisms we have out in the civilian world. So go yes. ahead, sir. So, no, it was... Uh, we kind of looked at each other like, who is this guy? And what is he talking about? But as we started to unpack and unfold that, I was like, okay, he was a, a Marine also. And once we found out that you were a Marine, that was it. The, the arms were open. And Brothers been, from another mother. <laughs> and there's been no looking back ever since. So I think it's unique that we actually are going to be uh, hosting our podcast here in a bar. And why is that important that, that we're starting our podcast here at the bar? Well, anyone who follows Marine Corps history knows that the Marine Corps was established in Tun Tavern, in a bar. And, uh, and to be here at the Tufan Lounge is absolutely appropriate. And, and as we, we move forward with some of the other discussions, we'll talk a little bit about some of the memorabilia. We've got Iron Mike over here, our sentry, I'll uh, stand in guard for the two of us. But yeah, Samuel Nichols had the Tun Tavern down in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was the beginning, we were starting to see the rumblings with the British and, and we knew a fight was about ready to come. And so he wanted to go where the real fighters were and that is a bar. So what the, the story goes or lore, we don't know if it's 100% true or not, I, I imagine it is, is he'd get them pretty plastered and they'd say, <laughs> go ahead and sign this piece of paper. And by the time they sobered up, they were actually on a naval vessel with a, uh, a rifle in their hand and a quarter foil on top of their cover. And they were snipers for, for our Navy. And uh, that, that's really how the Marine Corps started. And there's been no looking back ever since. No looking back. The finest fighting force ever uh, put together. And so here we are here at the Tufel Hunden Tavern. The goal of the tavern here is to create a World War I speakeasy. And we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of World War I, but as you look around the room, you're gonna see original World War I recruiting posters. We have a reproduction behind me of the Tufelhunden uh, Fountain, the Devil Dog Fountain. We've got uh, quite a few different covers over here off of my 
left shoulder ranging from a, a World War One era dress blues cover, a uh, actual combat helmet, and then down to the campaign cover that you see quite a lot uh, where you go every day. Every to work. day at Fort right? Harris Island, where we make Marines. That is our mission. And um, the, the primary mission is the recruit training regiment, and, and they make a, about 20,000 Marines a year. And what was unique, Zach, is that uh, during COVID, the mission did not stop. We didn't take a knee, we didn't pause, but we continued to safely transport coolies from a staging area, you know, safe, clean, ready to train to the Yellow Footprints of Paris Island. So let's talk about that for a second, because I think that could be our first opportunity to talk about the warrior's voice, and, and more importantly, the warrior's journey, because every show we're gonna do moving forward, we're gonna talk about that warrior journey. And the warrior journey is, is basically three parts. The first part is resistance, conflict, adversity. Again, that iron sharpening iron, getting us ready for that fight. The second part is the crucible. Now in that crucible, you have the abyss at the bottom of the crucible. The abyss stands for failure, and it stands for giving up. It stands for one thing that the Marines cannot stand more than anything else, and that's not accomplishing our mission. That is without question that's drilled in us from day one at both OCS and at uh, MCRD is mission accomplishment before troop welfare. So when you're in that crucible, that's that crisis of your life and you've got to get transformed and get through that. And in order to get through that crucible, you have to transform and change. Something has to happen because otherwise you're gonna get right back to that same place. And then once you make it through your crucible, and again, that crucible could be a bad relationship, it could be a drug or alcohol problem. In my case, it was my business potentially going bankrupt. In your case, it was, you could have been the first HNS battalion commander regimental commander in the history of the marine corps to not make missions <laughs> that ain't gonna happen is it sir so i never put it i never framed it quite that way um it, there was a lot of pressure in, in the sense that the mission must continue so a little bit of the backstory uh COVID was already in full force before i took the reins at hns battalion headquarters and service battalion and the police had just um departed from a tent city out in the weapons field training battalion area, there were several tents set up with uh, about 25 pulleys per. And what the, the previous commander quickly realized is that if pulley Zach is infected, 25 other pulleys are infected as well. So we had to, to cease fire, uh, take a knee, assess, and shift operations to the Citadel. Aboard the Citadel, we had the whole campus. And where's the Citadel located? It's just about uh, 45 miles north of Paris Island. Okay. Tremendous campus. Um, and I checked in, took the reins, and my counterpart took me up to the Citadel and, and I saw the operation taking place. At the same time, uh, the vaccination uh, testing was taking place. So police could volunteer um, to have their blood drawn and see how COVID is affecting them while they're in, uh, going through the process of boot camp. So we were maintaining. And uh, one thing that I really didn't factor was the Citadel students returning and Mother Nature had a vote. So here's a nightmare scenario. I have about uh, 1,300 pulleys at the Citadel. I have my battalion at Paris Island, uh, the Marine sailors and civilians, and a hurricane rolls in. So we have to evacuate Paris Island and we would have to evacuate the Citadel. That's, that's the And that nightmare. all falls on your shoulders, right? Well, originally it would have in a non-COVID environment, the Headquarters and Service Battalion Commander is also the Task Force Albany Commander. So if a hurricane rolls in, I put on my Task Force Albany hat, evacuate the base, and we all shift to, to Albany, Georgia um, until the hurricane passes, and then we come back. If, if that were the case, General Nethercott, my boss, General Julie Nethercott, she could say, all right, Rico, you've got Task Force Commitment, Task Force Albany, and Headquarters and Service Battalion. She didn't do that. She showed me some grace and mercy. She gave Task Force Albany to uh, Weapons Field Training Battalion Commander, so he had that mission. And I had my hands plenty full with Task Force Commitment. So let, let, let's back way, way, way back here. That right there is giving me such anxiety that I, and I imagine for our listeners too, that they're like, how in the world? We're dealing with a global pandemic. We're dealing with not having all of our guys in one place at, at a base that we've had for quite some time and we've really got a good system down. And then we've got a potential hurricane coming through. 
that is that's crazy so that that is definitely a crisis what i'd like to do is kind of go back a little bit and talk about what do you think prepared you for that and and not specifically about the training on how to get your logistics together i think but but those intangibles those things that our listeners can can draw from that because for you it's just another day in the office but that's because you probably went through some pretty heavy stuff leading up to that now i know in, in future podcasts you're going to really dive deep and talk about what you've done in your career starting all the way from you know cleveland ohio to, to where we are now but just give us a little bit of background on uh, as a marine officer and not just colonel rico player but any colonel what, what preparation would they have to be put in that situation well th that's a great question zach in the sense that any marine colonel colonels run the marine corps so uh, we look at our general officers to to protect and run the Marine Corps up and out. So up and out would be um, the National Capital Region, uh, everything in the Pentagon, everything across the river with Capitol Hill, with uh, decision makers, the power brokers in Washington, D.C. The general officers lean into that piece. Colonels, uh, when you're a colonel, so I've been doing public affairs for a long time. Um, so that's my specialty. So you have infantry, artillery, aviation, ground, logistics, whatever that is, if you've been doing that your entire career, you say at a colonel 18 to 20 years or so, at 20 to 25 years, um, your, your designation changes. So you're 80, 41, 80, 40, those numbers change compared to when you were doing your specialty. Um, but as a colonel, you, you're supposed to be able to shift to do any job. And because that's really a leadership position. It doesn't question. really matter if you're dealing with artillery, if you're dealing with manpower, or you're dealing with information. Is that it, right? It, it shouldn't matter. Generically, it does not matter. A, a, a colonel has a fraction. It, it should get accomplished. And we can unpack that, like you said, later on in another episode. But as a, a colonel of Marines, you should be able to receive an order from a general officer and execute. And just give our listeners a little background because I don't think they're going to run out and join the Marine Corps, and they're probably not going to have the you, good fortune. You can. <laughs> sorry, the, the good fortune to make it to Colonel. But but talk about some of those transferable intangibles that are not unique just to the Marine Corps, but they're unique to warriors. So talk about the some adversity that you maybe had early in your career that you really thought was almost too much, but how that prepared you for where you are now today. Zach, I think um, the, the great equalizer for the Marine Corps that translates to anyone, honor, courage, and commitment. I say that because we'll take mom and pop's treasure, their child, bring them into you know, the East or West Coast boot camp, transform them. They'll serve honorably four to 40 years, whatever that is. But no matter what, no matter how long you wear the cloth, you eventually have to take it off. And I think the Marine Corps' goal is to give back a better citizen once they take that off. But back to those three, honor, courage, and commitment. Yeah. And that's so deep because, sir, you, you've been in the Marine Corps for how many years? Long time. Okay, long time. 32 I, I, years. Wow, several decades. <laughs> I was in the Marine Corps for just a handful of years, from probably about six to eight years altogether. Okay. And it's interesting because my exposure to the Marine Corps was, was about as little as you could possibly get compared to what you see today. There were no combat deployments during my time in the Marine Corps. There was during attrition, we were starting to uh, draw back. My focus mainly was in infantry. I also went through recruit training like you did. That's and I also went through officer candidate school like you did. The difference where we started to diverge is I really wanted to get out into the civilian world rather quickly and right. I chose not to get my commission and move forward. But hearing you talk, everything you just said is exactly what I, what I gathered and I think what really helped prepare me in my life to prepare me for those crucibles. The honor is that real intangible. It's not just integrity. There's so many things that go into honor and we'll, we'll certainly talk about that. Courage is, is a big one because people think people that are courageous aren't scared. You have to be scared to be courageous. Courage is having that fear and moving forward and conquering that. And the reason you do that is because I think that third one, that commitment, the commitment to the mission, the commitment to your brothers and sisters that are on your left and right, the commitment to your country. And for us, the most sacred commitment I think we have as Marines, and that's commitment to our Marine Corps. We would never want to let them down. And when you were given that order and that mission, 
that mission wasn't just about today. It was making sure that we never took a knee during our recruit training process that I imagine some of the other branches probably took a little bit of a knee. Is that right? Well, um, um, I, I don't know for sure. I, everyone, every They service... didn't execute as flawlessly as the Marine Corps did. Can we agree on that at least, sir? <laughs> okay, what I can tell you is this. Because... And by the way, we're just talking as two <laughs> friends here. Nobody here is representing the United States Marine Corps just for the record. So. Absolutely. So what I can say factually is um, all services managed COVID, okay? Whether they paused or whatever, I, I don't know. For the Marine Corps, Marine Corps Recruit Depot Paris Island, we did not stop. I can also say factually, we are the only branch of service that moved three times. You could say four if we talk about moving from Paris Island to the Citadel, from the Citadel to Atlanta, from Atlanta to Jacksonville, Florida, and then concluding back at Paris Island. More than 21,000 police safely quarantined, cared for, and delivered to the yellow footprints. That's amazing. I, I know our, our motto in the Marine Corps is Semper Fidelis, but Always it really faithful. is uh, Semper Gumby. <laughs> Always, Always flexible. flexible. <laughs> you know, we've got to learn to improvise, overcome, adapt, and everything. Absolutely. So, sir, um, one of the things I think that really connected us, obviously, we as soon as we met each other, we knew that we had that special bond, as we do with all Marines, no matter what color, what background, what station they are in life. A Marine is a Marine and, and we're, we're brothers together. But I think the one thing that really started for you and I to, to develop this special relationship we have is our desire to tell our story. And not to tell our story from a self-serving way, but to tell our story as a way to teach and to grow others. Because ultimately, I think that is the hallmark of a leader is to lead others and to teach others how to lead others. I think a manager is someone that just simply tells people what to do. A leader is someone that inspires people, someone that gives them that confidence and helps develop them into better leaders. And the one thing I think that's so exciting is you just had a book that came out, didn't yes, you? Yes, yes. Do you have a copy of it anywhere? Uh, I think that, it's right over there. Uh, absolutely. All right. So, so off the record, um, you know, off the record, there, there's a whole lot we can unpack there. And, and we're going to have <laughs> several episodes just about the book specifically. But. Without question. But you talk about a, a leader and a manager, okay? Um, you talk about leading from the front. Do you lead from the middle or do you lead from the rear? You know, all, all those things. But, but for the book, you inspired the book. And here's why. You've talked about your crucibles. You've talked about, you know, warrior entrepreneurship. You've talked about those things that after being in the Marine Corps for more than 30 years, it was difficult for me to get my arms and my mind around. And I looked at that and said, okay, don't talk about it, be about it, make a difference. General Neller, I was his public affairs officer at uh, Marine Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia. General Neller was- He was the Commandant com of the Marine Corps. And explain what the Commandant is. So the Commandant is the senior officer in the Marine Corps. On the, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he's the Secretary for the Marine Corps who reports to the chairman and of course the National Security Advisor and the President of the United States. And, and for Marines, the, the Commandant almost takes on almost a godly like image. It's a lot more than just being the senior officer. It, it's something pretty special. Absolutely. And, and at that time, General Neller was a Lieutenant General and I was a Lieutenant Colonel. And uh, he, I had the privilege of having, I had the honor of having him promote me to Colonel. And one thing that stuck with me is that, you know, he told me, said, okay, you're a, a colonel now. Use the wings to, to shield and guard and lift up others. As wow. you continue your journey, use the, the, the eagles to do something, to make a difference. And that stuck with me, especially as a public affairs officer. We're, we're more often than not the junior person at the table. And, and we get um, our recommendations. We, we provide recommendations. We don't normally provide hey, uh, a knife hand and, and execute something. So that's what Off the Record was about. It was the, the things that, that I looked at and I said, well, how can I help those young, those junior public affairs officers coming behind me? And like you said, we'll unpack that in another episode. Gotcha, gotcha. And it's interesting because you're still in the fight. You're, you, you're you know, entering your third decade in the Marine Corps. I've been out for a long time. You can obviously tell <laughs> by the way that we're shaped here. Um, but anyway, for me, it was even though that short amount of time I had compared to you, 
I it was so inspiring for me to teach me how that iron sharpens iron and to prepare me for my crucible. And that's really what, what came up with the book that I ended up writing, The Warrior Entrepreneur, which is not really about warriors and not really about entrepreneurs, even though that's what I thought it was. It's simply about that warrior's journey. And that's the goal of every one of our podcasts. Our mission for every one of our podcasts is to share another story of what that warrior's journey looks like from conflict, challenge, resistance, crucible, crisis, and then transformation. Or in some cases, you may not make it out of the crucible. And that's okay. Failure is okay mm -hmm. sometimes if you've had enough. And as civilians, some people aren't trained to be Marines or SEALs, and they just don't want to do that for whatever reasons, and that's okay. And we'll talk about the lessons that we learn from that as, as we get on. Well, that's really kind of um, taking us to the end of our, our third cast here. What would you say are some of the reasons you think people should tune in for the next couple of episodes here, sir? I, I would say, Zach, I would think if, if anyone's interested in self-improvement, if anyone's looking for um, that, that warrior spirit inside of them, because I stand firm that, that there's a warrior voice in everyone. Um, like I said, the, the mom who's struggling, the, the, the dad who's coming to a fork in the road, do I go left, right, or center, um, active duty, retired, there are no former Marines, they're active duty, retired, reserve. Um, everyone, re regardless of, of service, regardless of, um, of, of challenges, there's a warrior voice inside of them telling them the right thing to do. Whether they listen to it or not, that, that, that's on them. And our job here is to tell other people and how to let their warrior voice come through. Without question. We want to teach you as your listeners here how to find your warrior voice because it's in every one of us. Now, the warrior's journey is a tough journey. And not everyone is cut out to be a journey, nor should everybody be a warrior. But if it's in there, we're going to show you through the stories and the things that we're going to talk about is, is how you're going to be able to find that. Without question. So as we come to the end, one thing we'd like to do and, and we're continuing to do here is we'd like to dedicate every one of these episodes to a fallen warrior. Sir, would you mind taking the honor of dedicating our very first show to a, a warrior that you actually served with? with without question. And, and she's in my book as well. And that is uh, Major Megan McClung. Um, and, and I'll read it. Major Megan McClung, a media officer with one MEP forward, that's Marine Expeditionary Force forward. She gave it all. She was the first female Marine Corps officer killed in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Her drive, energy, enthusiasm, leadership, and motivation remains a driving force in Marine Corps public affairs today. She dedicated her life to telling the Marine Corps story and making a difference in the lives of every Marine, sailor, civilian, and journalist she worked with. Megan, Semper Fidelis. Semper Fidelis. Thank you.